Hi, my name is Michael Rogalski, and today I will be presenting our study, which addresses finite element modeling of the femoral neck. Our study focuses on the clinically significant femoral neck region because femoral neck fractures constitute 53% of all hip fractures and lead to mortality rates as high as 27%. Our aim is to understand how the femoral neck is loaded during daily activity in order to identify activities that may encourage bone remodeling and therefore improve strength. However, several questions persist regarding daily loading of the femoral neck. For example, how is daily activity best represented in FE models? Is it enough to only include the hip joint force or should all 22 hip spanning muscles also be included? What exactly are the consequences of these two different models on the strain distribution? We address these questions using a subset of data from a previously published study. The study gathered kinematic and ground reaction force data of 20 postmenopausal women walking at a normal speed. Muscle and hip forces were calculated from this data and combining them with CT scans of the femur, we developed two FE models. One only including the hip joint force and the other including both the hip joint and muscle forces. Next, the lateral, medial, anterior, and posterior quadrants of the middle neck were identified based on anatom anatomical landmarks. Finally, the median, maximum, and minimum principal strains and their orientations were calculated at the peak force during the first half of the stance phase. We first compare the principal strains in each quadrant. When muscle forces are included in the medial quadrant, both the compressive and tensile strains decrease in magnitude. In the posterior quadrant, the tensile strain decreases in magnitude, while the compressive strain increases in magnitude. In the anterior quadrant, both the compressive and tensile strains decrease in magnitude. In the lateral quadrant, the tensile strain decreases in magnitude, while the compressive strain increases in magnitude. Most notably, the tensile strains decreased in every single quadrant. Next, we compare the principal orientations in each quadrant. The X and Z coordinates correspond to the medial and proximal directions, respectively. When muscles are included in the posterior quadrant, the X coordinate significantly increases, representing a shift in the medial direction. In the lateral quadrant, the X coordinate significantly decreases, representing a shift in the lateral direction. The medial and anterior quadrants, on the other hand, do not exhibit large changes in principal orientation. We found that the tensile strains decreased in every quadrant while the compressive strains varied in response to muscle forces. As a result, when muscle forces are included, the femoral neck is primarily loaded in compression, not bending. One important implication of this finding is that compressive loading contradicts Wolf trajectorial theory, a highly cited theory that claim, claims tensile forces are present in the femoral neck during daily loading. Further, including muscle forces causes large shifts in the principal orientation of the posterior and lateral quadrants. This may lead to better understanding of load paths and structural response in the clinically significant femoral neck region. The limitations of our study are that results may vary for other regions of the femur, other activities, or non-postmenopausal women. I would like to acknowledge the Mechanical Engineering Department at U of I and the VLUX Foundation for funding the project, and my lab group for their constant help and support. Thank you.